Let me invite you to take out your message notes this morning that are inside your bulletin. Looks something like this. And then uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 14 this morning. And and really a a passage, a story that's so familiar, I'm I'm not going to read the whole story to you, but I'm going to pull from Exodus chapter 14. And so I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to follow with me there. We'll have all the scripture on the screen behind me as well. We had a really... Uh, really special Christmas Eve service this last Sunday at the Oakdale Fine Arts Center. And uh, I hope that uh, you had a great Christmas with your family, a special time. I want to say thank you to everyone who worked so hard to make this Christmas Eve service uh, happen and to those who were able to attend just for being there and, and making it very special. It was a very good day last Sunday and it was good to be with you. Now, though, we turn our attention to a new year which, of course, begins tonight at midnight. Now, a a new year is always a good time to take a look at our priorities, to look at our commitments, and a lot of times that's what uh, my first message series of the year will cover. But there's another topic that I like to teach on at the beginning of a new year, and that is in seeking God's will and direction for our lives, especially when things are not going the way that we want them to or expect them to. And so for the next four weeks, that's what we're going to be focusing on. And to kind of set the stage for why we would even need to talk about that, let's take a little poll this morning. How many of you, if you are being honest, and you're in church, so you're obligated to be honest, would admit that there have been times in your life, maybe now, maybe in the past, maybe once or maybe many times, where you felt like God was indifferent, inattentive, Uncorrupt, I can't say the word, cooperative, I don't know, or just plain late when you needed him most. Now before you raise your hands, I want you to look at those four words again. I can't say them, but you can read them. Indifferent, inattentive, inattentive, now I'm really messing them up, uncooperative or late. And I want you to be completely honest with yourself, and I want you to be completely honest with me, okay? So here we go. How many of you have ever felt that way about God in your life? All right, very good. Keep your hands up if you would for just a moment. I want you to look around. Take a look around, okay? All right, because you just learned something. Now you can put your hands down. You thought it was just you, didn't you? You thought it was just you. You didn't really want to raise your hand. The first time I said, raise your hand, you thought, oh, I should, I can't, but I, I better not. Because you might have been the only one that would admit to that. And the reason that it is so difficult for us when we feel like God is not showing up in our life, which is something that I think every one of us have experienced at some point, when we get to a place where we don't feel like God is showing up, it's because part of the reason it's so hard because we think we're the only one. We're think, we think we're the only one who has experienced that. We're the only one who's thinking that. Now there are a couple of things that make this even worse than normal. One of them is people like me. Preachers. Preachers have a tendency to really, really, really make you feel like you are the only one. Because preachers can make it all sound so easy, can't we? Preachers make it sound so simple. And everybody in church nods their head and says amen. And then, if God is indifferent, inattentive, uncooperative, or late for you, the preacher says, well, you just need more faith. Or you just need to pray harder. Or you just need to get rid of sin. And listen, sometimes we do need more faith, don't we? I know I do. Sometimes we do need to pray harder. Sometimes we do need to deal with our sin. But it is so easy for us to come to the conclusion that the reason God is indifferent, uh, inattentive, uncooperative, or late is really our fault because it appears to be working out for everybody else. Because God seems to be answering everybody else's prayers. But it doesn't feel that way for you, so therefore there must be something wrong with you. So I wanted us all to raise our hand and say that at some point in our lives, for the most part, we have felt like God was indifferent, that he didn't pay attention, that he wouldn't cooperate, or he was just plain late when we needed him the most. Then you have some Christian friends, 
And they make it even worse because they say things like, you know, the other day I was at the mall and I was in a hurry. And I just said, Lord, I'm in such a hurry. Dear Lord, I just need a really good parking spot. And let me tell you what happened. I was driving down the front and this lady pulled out and it was the closest parking spot. You know which one I'm talking about? Right next to the handicapped spot. The closest spot. And, and, and she pulled out and I pulled in and I knew in that moment God had answered my prayers. Right? Amen, someone said. And you're like, shut up. Okay, because I'm asking God for a job. I'm asking God to heal my marriage. I'm asking God to bring my son or my daughter back. I'm asking God to heal. And God is answering your prayers about a parking spot? Are you kidding me? Now, you would agree with me. It's a problem. It's a problem for our state of mind. It's a problem for our relationship with other people. And it is certainly a problem for our relationship with God when we feel like he's not showing up. Because you see, after a while, when it feels like he's not showing up, when we need him the most, our faith starts to develop little cracks. And we begin to think that if God is silent, then God must be absent. And, and, and if God is not answering my prayer, then there may not be a God. Or, or if God isn't engaging in my circumstances, God isn't doing what I need God to do, then maybe even if there is a God, he's not a God that's ever going to be active in my life. And our faith starts to crack. And our confidence starts to slip. And our hope starts to dwindle. And now you've got a real problem in your life. So here's what we're going to do for the next four weeks. I'm going to tell you one story from the Old Testament and three stories from the New Testament about four men who God absolutely loved, God 100% knew their name, and yet at the same time, there was a point in each of their lives when they felt like God was indifferent, inattentive, uncooperative, or just plain late. And here's what I hope we can all take away from these four weeks together. I hope we all can walk away and realize that we can go through the wilderness we can go through dry times. We can go through times when we feel distant from God. We can go through times and seasons and stages and chapters of our life when God seems indifferent, uncooperative, inattentive, and late, and we can still maintain our faith, okay? That's our goal for these next few weeks. Because listen, God is not being indifferent. He's not being inattentive. He's not being uncooperative, and God is never late, even when it seems like he is. So here's the first story, again, found in Exodus chapter 14. The Israelites, if you remember the story, have been slaves in Egypt for more than 400 years. They cried out to God for help. Then God sent Moses to warn Pharaoh to let his people go. Pharaoh had finally given Moses permission to lead the people out of Egypt. But once they started on their journey, Pharaoh changed his mind. He realized that he had just lost the services of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of slaves. And that without that pull of free labor, his own people were going to have to replace them in their work. And so Pharaoh Pharaoh assembled his army and he sets out after the Israelites. Now the Israelites had come to the bank of the Red Sea and they had set up camp at a place called Piharoth. All of a sudden they noticed the army approaching, more than 600 chariots in full pursuit. And they began to realize that they were now facing an impossible situation with no possible means of escape. In front of them, if you can imagine, was the Red Sea. They were not going to swim across it. They were going to die in it if they got into it. Behind them was the Egyptian army. There was absolutely nowhere to turn. It appeared that their only options were to be killed in battle or to drown in the sea. Seemingly, they had painted themselves into a corner. Things looked absolutely hopeless. And guess what? They were exactly where God wanted them to be. And so today, we're going to look at how you can deal with situations that seem to be impossible, especially when God, it seems like he's indifferent to your struggle. Now listen, the bottom line is some of you are here today and you're facing a Red Sea in your life right now. 
theme, things look hopeless, they feel hopeless, and you're not exactly sure what to do. Well, there are five spiritual truths I want to show you from this story that can help maybe get you to the other side of your Red Sea. We'll start with this. When God seems indifferent, the first thing you must do is remember that God has a purpose for your problem. You've got to remember, you've got to understand that God has a purpose for your problem. Now, what I'm about to say next is really, really important. So I want you to really listen carefully to this. And if you've been around Oakdale for a while, you may have heard me say this before. As best I can tell, there are four reasons why bad things happen in our lives. Number one is the result of sin that we commit. See, sometimes bad things happen because we are suffering the consequences of our own sin. Now, if we're Christians, we know that we will not suffer the eternal consequences of sin in eternity, but we will absolutely still have to deal with sin and the consequences of it here on earth. Are we all on the same page about that? Not one shake of the head. Okay, let me go back over this because this is probably pretty important for you to understand. Okay? We will not suffer eternal consequences of sin in heaven, but we 100% will suffer the consequences of our sins here on earth. Are you with me on that? This is, yes, yes, yes. It's important to understand. Sometimes you'll hear that that's not the case, but you need to read your Bible. That's what the Bible says. Number two, the second reason we suffer the consequence of somebody else's sin. You realize that? Sometimes bad things happen that we have absolutely no control over, but they happen because somebody else chose to sin. The third reason is that we are suffering the consequences of living in a broken world. See, sometimes things, bad things happen because we live on earth, not in heaven. In heaven, there will be no tornadoes, no earthquakes, no droughts, no floods, no ice storms, and that just covers Oklahoma. But I'm right? A fourth reason that bad things happen is because God, listen now, has either allowed it or caused it. The Bible says that God is in control of all things. And yet there are times when he allows or causes bad things to happen. At least bad from our perspective. Because they are part of his ultimate plan. And, and it's his plan to do away with all things that are bad and ultimately make everything good again. Here's what you need to understand. The events in your life do not happen by accident. God is in control, but he is also, he has a purpose for everything. He has a plan for dealing with your sin. He has a plan for dealing with the sins of others. He has a plan for redeeming this broken world that we live in. And do we agree? He had a plan when he brought the Israelites to the Red Sea. Now we understand why they felt hopeless. We get why they were scared, but we know the other side, don't we? We know what was about to happen. Guess what? He has a plan, he has a purpose for the Red Sea in your life as well. And I can't help but think, as I sit here and I look at you this New Year's Eve, and as I look family to family, person to person to person, we could spend the rest of our time this morning talking about some of the Red Seas that you have faced and some of the incredible things that God has brought you through, or maybe is still bringing you through in your life right now today. Let me show you the two things that he wants to accomplish in every situation, no matter how bad or how difficult it may be. First of all, God wants to make his glory known to others. That is important for us to understand. No matter how bad, no matter how difficult, God wants to make his glory known to others. Listen to what God says to Moses about this entire Red Sea plan beginning in verse 1. He says, Exodus 14, he says, Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Piharoth between the Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore across the Baal Zephon. And then Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after you. Listen to this. I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And so the Israelites camped there as they were told. 
Basically, God says, I'm putting a plan in place that isn't going to make any sense to anybody but me. And that plan is going to ensure that by the time this story is complete, Pharaoh and Egypt and and Israel and ultimately the whole world is going to know that I am the Lord. Now the question is, do you see that God can do these same things in your life? Things are happening to you that do not make sense. But remember, your story isn't over yet. But when the story is over, you can count on this. God will make his glory known to others and you get to be a part of that if you choose to. And that brings us to the second thing that God wants to accomplish in every situation. He wants to teach you to trust him more. He wants to make his glory known, but he also wants to teach you to trust him more. Now, you know how this story ends, right? I don't think I'm giving away any surprises when I tell you that eventually the waters of the Red Sea part and the Israelites walk through to safety. And that was God's plan all along because as a result of this experience, verse 31 says, And when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Now here's what I need you to see. This Red Sea that you're facing right now serves a purpose. God can use it to glorify himself and he can use it to strengthen the bond between you and him. You can come through this ordeal with faith stronger than you even ever had before in your life. And so, as you face a Red Sea, an impossible situation where it seems like God's not interested in you, you've got to remember that God absolutely has a purpose for your problem. Secondly, as you face a Red Sea, we've got to identify God's perspective on the situation. This is incredibly important. When the Israelites looked up and they saw the Egyptian army approaching in the distance, do you know what their immediate response was? They panicked. Verse 11 says, And they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? I love the Israelites because they're smart alecks like me, okay? I mean, I love it. I'm serious. That sounds just like something I would say. God, you know, we didn't, there wasn't enough place to plant us in the ground. In Egypt, you had to bring us all the way out here to make us die. We could have died back then. But here's the thing. That's a pretty amazing attitude considering how they had witnessed the power of God in their life. I mean, in, in crazy, miraculous ways. But they'd already forgotten about that. And now they were convinced that this was the end. They go on in verse 12. To say, didn't we tell you? Oh, I love that. I love telling God this, okay? Didn't we tell you this would happen? By the way, I don't remember them telling God or Moses this happened. But this is what they said. Didn't we tell you this would happen when we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Pretty sure they never said that, okay? Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It is better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. And so not only are they smart aleck, they're, they exaggerate. They'd be great preachers, okay? And, and, and here's the thing. As I, as I look at what they say, I, I, I suppose they're right. I mean, I guess it would be better to be a slave in Egypt than to die in the desert. But here's the thing. God didn't intend for them to do either. He had a plan for them. Plans greater than they could possibly imagine. And yet you get the impression from reading this story that if Moses had called a business meeting... And taken a vote, the majority would have chosen to go back to Egypt right then and there. Now this is a pretty strong reminder of how easy it is for us to lose God's perspective on a situation. Too often, when we're confronted with an impossible situation, rather than meeting it head on, we take the easy way out. We say, well, we don't want to face the Red Sea and we don't want to face Pharaoh's army, so let's just go back to Egypt. Let's resume our life as slaves. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want you to settle for second best. He doesn't want you to run from the crisis. He wants you to meet it head on with courage and conviction that he is going to help see it through. Understand something. The Red Sea that you're facing is not the impasse that you think it is. 
It may be tempting to take the easy way out, to settle for second best, but God has a better plan. He wants you to look at the big picture. He wants you to look at life from his perspective. He will get you through this impossible situation. When God seems indifferent, you've got to remember that he has a purpose for your problem. You've got to identify God's perspective on the situation. Thirdly, as you face a Red Sea, you must rely on God's promise. You've got to rely on God's promise to you. I, I once heard a speaker ask an audience, if your success was guaranteed, wouldn't you be willing to endure just about anything? In other words, if you had an ironclad contract stating that if you, let's say, dug ditches in the rain every day for six months, you will have complete financial freedom for the rest of your life. Wouldn't you be willing to dig ditches for six months? And the obvious answer, and I can see some of you shaking your head, the obvious answer is absolutely. Of course you would. The truth is, as human beings, we can endure just about anything if we know the outcome. But one of the most difficult aspects of facing a Red Sea is dealing with the feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. When you're facing an impossible situation, when it looks like everything is falling apart around you, like there's no chance that things are going to work out the way that you think they should, when you're facing a Red Sea, you've got to rely on God's promise. What is that promise? Mo Moses shared it with the people in verses 13 and 14. Let me read it to you. He said to them, Do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now notice that God promised the Israelites two things. First, he promised that the problem would be completely eradicated. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. And that was true. See, we have a tendency to put a band-aid on our problem, to sweep our problems under the rug, to get them out of the way for a few days. God promises that he can remove it once and for all. Secondly, he promised to fight for them. Now, without his help, the Israelites didn't stand a chance, but neither do we. We need him in the battle. He has promised to be there for us. He has promised to fight for us. But we must rely on him. Now what does it mean to rely? Once again, let's look at the verses 13 and 14. Relying on God's promise involves three things. Number one, we have to fear not. Fear not. The words fear not appear in the Bible more than 50 different times. But what's the significance of that? I think it's this. The command, fear not, means you can choose not to be afraid. Now, of course, no one ever chooses to be afraid. But when fear comes, with God's help, you can choose to reject that fear that you naturally feel in your life. Fear not. Moses also said that we've got to stand firm. In other words, don't compromise your integrity. Don't give up. Don't run. Don't hide. Stand and face the situation. And then finally, we've got to be still. And that may be the hardest one for us, right, Marty McBee? It's hard sometimes to be still. Of course, being still doesn't mean doing nothing. We've, we, hopefully, we learned that a while ago. Moses isn't talking about your body. He's talking about your heart. We have to be still in our heart. Being still involves blocking out all distractions, placing your focus on your heavenly Father. Remember this, the peace of God can't hit a moving target. If you want your heart to be filled with God's peace, your heart is going to have to become still long enough to receive that peace. As you face the Red Sea in your life with the enemy closing in from behind, remember that God has a purpose for your problem. You've got to identify God's perspective on the situation. You've got to rely on God's promise to see you through. Number four, you've got to trust in God's protection. You've got to trust in God's protection. Did you know that when the Israelites first began their journey, they were led by a cloud by day 
and a pillar of fire at night. Do you remember that? Does that sound familiar to the story? But when they arrived at the bank of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army began closing in on them, the cloud actually moved away. It moved around behind the Israelite camp, between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Verse 20 says that the cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and the Israelites did not approach each other all night. Now at this point, God had not yet performed the miracle that would deliver the Israelites. That would come later. Until then, they had to trust in God's protection. Now let me show you something kind of interesting. In verse 19, it says, Then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. So basically, the angel of God who they either could or could not see, we're not exactly sure, and the cloud, which they definitely could see, both of which, the angel and the cloud, had been leading them each and every day in the desert, suddenly does something completely different. It disappears from in front of them. Here's my question. How do you think the Israelites reacted when they saw the cloud beginning to drift away? Undoubtedly, like you and I are prone to, to do, good word, they thought, yeah, there it goes. That's it. We're sunk now. God is leaving and now we're on our own. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like you're all by yourself? I feel confident that the Israelites did because they were so much like us and their ability to convince themselves that God is going to abandon us. Despite the fact that he has been so faithful to provide for us and protect us in the past. I mean, never mind the plagues. Never mind the miracles. The cloud is moving. It's all over. We're on our own. Well, it might have appeared that way at first. But you know what happened? The cloud moved around behind them and then actually protected them throughout the entire night. You see, as you face any impossible situation in your life, there's something that, that you need to keep in mind. No matter how bad things seem, things are not as bad as they could be. And the reason they're not as bad as they could be is because God is preventing them from getting that bad. Now, I, I know the phrase, things could be worse, is usually the setup line for a joke. But, but I'm not joking when I say that if you look at your situation through the eyes of faith, you will see how God has kept his hand on you in spite of even the most terrible difficulties. He's protecting you right now until the day he parts your Red Sea. We gotta remember that God has a purpose for our problem. Identify his perspective on the situation. Rely on his promise. Trust in his protection. And then finally, as you face a Red Sea, you also have to depend on God's power. We can't leave God's power out of the equation. This is what God said to Moses in verse 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. You see, God wants to deliver you from your impossible situation. He wants to part the Red Sea for you. But for that to happen, you may have to stretch you may have to reach for, and you will definitely have to depend on God's power, recognizing that you will never be able to make it through on your own power. Remember that this staff that Moses had carried symbolized God's power in his life. When God first called Moses, he told Moses to throw down the staff, and the staff became a snake. He told Moses to pick it up and it became a rod again. Moses and Aaron each used the staff to bring plagues upon Egypt. The staff was waved over the Nile River and the Nile turned to blood. The staff was stretched over the streams and plagues of frogs were sent. 
The staff struck the ground and plagues of gnats swarmed the land. The staff was stretched to the sky and hail was rained down upon Egypt and on and on and on. Understand, the staff wasn't magic, but it symbolized the power of God. God was saying to Moses, you hold my power in your hand. If you're willing to depend on me, you can once again witness a miracle. Now listen to me. God's power is available for you too. If you're willing to trust in his power, you can experience a miracle in your life. I don't know what seemingly impossible situation you face today, but I know this. If you depend on God's power, he will supply you with what you need. He will get you through to the other side of the sea. Now, I need you to understand something important, and I've said a lot to this point, but if you walk away and you don't hear this part, it's probably not gonna be worth anything, okay? So I need you to hear me. The other side of the sea, it may not be what you expect, okay? It may not be what you want. It may not be what you hope for. The Israelites were expecting the promised land when they left Egypt. Instead, they got 40 years in the wilderness before they were ready for their reward. The disciples in Jesus' day were expecting a king to rule over Israel and return their nation to its former glory. Instead, do you remember what they got? They got a crucified Savior and ultimately a resurrected Savior. Look, you may be expecting the other side of your Red Sea to produce a healing for you or for someone that you love. And you know what? That may be exactly what you get. Or what you may get is the ultimate healing that lasts forever. Do you understand the difference? As a church, you've heard me say many times, no matter what, it's either going to get better or what? It's going to get a whole lot better. God has a plan are you facing a Red Sea in your life? Are there situations in your life that seem absolutely impossible? Remember, it only seems impossible to you. God has a plan. It may be something different than you could have ever imagined, but he absolutely has a plan. He will get you to the other side. And when he does, you can be sure that others are going to see his glory in your life and your relationship with him will be stronger than ever before. You're not on your own. You don't have to fight the army and you don't have to conquer the sea in your own strength. Here's what you have to do. You've got to remember that God has a purpose for your problem. You've got to identify God's perspective, not our human one. You've got to rely on the promise that God has given us, that he will be with us no matter what. You've got to trust in his protection. And ultimately, you've got to depend on God's power. Let me ask you to bow your heads. And let's, let's begin to really focus in on what God is trying to say to us, what kind of response he wants from us today. Heavenly Father, as, as we come to you this morning, as Amy has already pointed out, we're prone to wander. We're prone to forget about just how faithful you've been to us and how good you've been to us and how many incredible ways you have provided for us. God, it is very easy for us to bless you one day for the incredible things you've done and, and a few days later to say, God, where are you? Where have you been? We don't even know if you're here. It's so easy for us to feel like you're not showing up, God. But I pray today through the story of the Exodus, the story of the Israelites in the Red Sea, you would remind us that even when a situation seems impossible, it is not impossible because you're in charge. And God, we're not promised it'll turn out exactly the way we want it to or the way we think it will, but we are promised that number one, you will be there for us and number two, you will see us through to the other side, whatever the other side looks like. And so I pray this morning as we begin a new year that this would be a year in which we would set our hearts and our trust and our hope 
all on you, God. Maybe there's somebody here this morning who doesn't know you as their God, doesn't know Jesus as the savior of their life. I pray that today you would plant a seed in their heart that would allow them to begin to seek you and want to know you in their life. For those of us who've known you, who love you, who have surrendered to you, I pray that we might live our lives differently with the confidence and the knowledge that you have been and are and will be faithful to us in every way, even in the midst of impossible situations. God, we love you. May our love be reflected in the way that we live our life for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Let's stand together. And as Amy leads us, let me encourage you just to think about how God wants you to respond to him today. Whatever that impossible situation is that you have faced or are facing now, bring it to him, entrust it to him, and let him know, I know God, you've promised to see me to the other side. As we sing and worship, I'll be here this morning. If you need someone to pray with you, be happy to do that. Let's worship him and respond to him. And come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Let's go to verse 2. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has no home. Now your grace is always with me and I'll never be alone. Let me ask you to bow your heads. And if you would, just for a moment, as we kind of finish up this morning, let me lead you. First of all, let me lead you, if you're in a place right now where you would say, no Red Sea for me, no army crushing down on me. I'm in a good place right now. If that's you, I want you to spend the next 30 seconds and I want you to praise your God and thank Him for the blessing that you're experiencing right now. Go, do it. Give that to Him. And if you're here this morning and you do feel like you're facing a Red Sea in your life, then let me challenge you right now to pray and think through what we've just talked about. Tell God that you're willing to trust Him. Tell God that you're willing to depend on Him and rely on Him. And that you will lean into Him no matter what happens next and no matter how long it takes. Go, pray, tell Him what needs to be said. We're going to sing this last verse. Let's sing it together. Let's sing it out strong. Let's sing it like redeemed people who have a Savior mm, who loves them and will always be there for them. Mm. Let's worship. And know oh, to grace how great a debt daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. 
Seal it for thy courts above.